Winter Palace, St. Petersburg, May 6th, 1917. The hammers of the typewriter crash down on the page. Extraordinary Commission of Inquiry for the Investigation of Illegal Acts by Ministers and Other Responsible Persons of the Tsarist Regime. Anna, once a maid of honor to the Empress of Russia, nervously wrings her hands. She sits in the throne room, but there's no longer a throne in it. The wallpaper has been torn down, just like the Tsar. Anna, you see, has been brought here from prison. Across from her, the interrogator smokes, and when the typist is ready, he begins to ask questions. He wants to know about the Tsar and Tsarina, their contacts with occultists and mesmerists, but especially about one man. How, he wants to know, did the Imperial family meet Rasputin? Thanks so much to World Anvil for helping us forge today's historical tale. If there's one character from Russian history everybody knows, it's Grigory Rasputin. Arguably more famous than the Tsar and Tsarina he served, his reputation for occult powers and debauchery has transcended the historical reality of his life, transforming him into everything from a horror movie villain to a comic book character to a beer mascot to the subject matter of that amazing Boney M song we riffed with as our April Fool's episode last year. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, that song slaps. After all, who can resist the story of a mad monk who brought down a dynasty? But did he? See, Rasputin became involved with the Tsar at a pivotal moment in Russian history. Just as Nicholas II lost his aristocratic powers and the monarchy entered a tailspin into war and revolution, and Rasputin became seen in political circles and the press as either the cause of the royal's detachment and decline or a symptom. Death, too, only enhanced his legend. Because once the Tsar abdicated and the country barreled towards revolution, the dead Rasputin served as a convenient way for monarchists and royal advisors to shift blame for the Tsar's poor decisions away from themselves. Even our understanding of Rasputin's assassination comes from the, let's just say, dubious accounts of his killers. In other words, Rasputin is surrounded by a cloud of myth. But like many tales from history, the true story is far more incredible. The man who would walk in imperial palaces and serve an emperor was born in January 1869 in the Siberian village of Pakrovska. And we know about as much of Rasputin's childhood as we do about most Siberian peasants from the time. Which is to say, oh, almost nothing. His family was illiterate, and Grigory would remain so until his 20s. And though political enemies would later claim that he was a horse thief, local records from the time indicate his wild youth never rose above public drunkenness, petty theft, and insubordination toward local officials. At 18, he married a peasant woman. And a decade later, things hadn't really changed much. He was 28, illiterate, living with his father, only now he had three children. But all in all, a completely ordinary background. Then, one day, he just kind of left. Now later he would claim to have seen a religious vision, an icon of the Virgin Mary weeping, but it also may have been a more mundane cause, like a crisis of faith or simply an urge to travel. Whatever the reason, in 1897, he set off to walk to a monastery of St. Nicholas, where he claimed to have studied under the local starets, a term for a spiritual elder who detained holiness through spare living and deep meditation. Presumably, this was where Rasputin learned to read, though he declined to stay in the monastery. Monastic life would have meant giving others authority over him, and Rasputin was always wary of that. So instead, he took to the road as a wandering pilgrim, which was a surprisingly popular life choice for men in 19th century Russia. Those seeking spiritual enlightenment, or even just travel and excitement, would simply walk across country to whatever place of pilgrimage they set as a goal. People of all classes did it, traveling in groups and occasionally practicing self-mortification by wearing shackles or engaging in other forms of discomfort. Now, personally, Rasputin found shackles distracting. Instead, he tried wearing the same shirt for a year at a time without removing it, walking to shrines and monasteries through heat and cold, dodging brigands and meeting fellow pilgrims. Stinky, but far more comfy. He did this on and off for years, even claiming to have walked to Mount Athos in Greece, which, if he started at home, would be roughly like walking from New York to Los Angeles. Whew, my dogs are barking just thinking about that. And it was on one of these journeys that he began to feel a bit of his own power. Back on the home front, however, his family felt that the Grigori who had left for the monastery of St. Nicholas was not the one who came back. Now he prayed with an ecstatic fervor that was entrancing to watch, and moved with a new confidence even among the upper class. 
He stared directly at people with an intensity that they never forgot, and seemed to have an ability to read someone at first meeting, understanding what they wanted, how best to talk to them, or their secret sins. Within a few years, he was leading a prayer group in Bokrovska, which met in a friend's root cellar. There, Rasputin's followers, mostly his family and a few locals, sang hymns of his own creation and spoke about God. But not everyone was happy with Rasputin. A local priest tried to warn others away from the pilgrim, who, after all, was not a priest, by the way, and some said that female followers were washing his body before worship. Plus, there were rumors that he had become linked with the Kleisti a much older sect known for flagellation and accused of sexual rights that the Orthodox Church deemed heretical. But nonetheless, his fame grew, and people started coming to see him. By 1904, he was taking trips to a nearby city where he was welcomed as a studatz himself, known for acting as a spiritual advisor for any who came to him, and he was rumored to be able to heal people with prayer, part of a long-standing tradition in Russia of holy men able to perform miracles. While there, he began meeting figures in the Orthodox Church, who were so impressed with his saintliness that they sent him to St. Petersburg with a letter of introduction. Now, what exactly Rasputin was supposed to do in the capital is still up for debate. He claimed to be raising money for a church, though he dropped that idea pretty quickly once he arrived. And instead, he went to parties. See, when he arrived in St. Petersburg, he quickly fell in with an archbishop named Theophon, who had a tendency to collect firebrand right-wing preachers around him. He liked to bring these men into aristocratic salons to nudge the political and religious conversation. There was the ultranationalist Bishop Hermogenes, for example, who'd reportedly castrated himself in his 30s and kicked a young Joseph Stalin out of seminary. Also, there was the monk Iliador, who advocated for deporting all foreigners and wrote deranged pamphlets about how international cabals of Jews and Freemasons were trying to topple the Tsar. It was this incredibly normal and rational circle that Rasputin ended up joining, and they became some of his earliest supporters. Though in truth, he would quickly outshine them all. Because the bored aristocrats of St. Petersburg saw something in Rasputin. His sincerity and religious ecstasy was raw, vital, and exciting. His gray-green eyes bore into you when you met him, and he seemed to just know what you were thinking, you know? And despite his peasant upbringing, he never appeared intimidated by titles or wealth. In fact, his appearance and rough manners added to his mystique, at a time when few aristocrats had seen a Siberian peasant, much less spoken to one. Rasputin appeared exotic and a little threatening, part of the real Russia the Europeanized upper class had lost touch with. When he spoke about faith, it felt grounded and alive, and the way he talked to these aristocrats, touched and stroked their hands, particularly ladies' hands, well, people found it simultaneously provoking, repellent, and magnetic. But just to be clear, Rasputin was certainly not the only mystic running in high circles at the time. In fact, the Russian aristocracy was awash in occultists, mesmerists, spirit mediums, and supposed prophets. These figures increasingly appealed to Russia's upper class, who had become disengaged from Orthodox Christianity and began experimenting with new religious ideas. This ran the gamut from a young Prince Yusupov, who we'll return to later in this story, believing he'd acquired clairvoyant powers, to the composer Alexander Skryabin, using occult themes in his music, believing if they were played correctly, it could end the world. So, yeah, Rasputin slid nicely into this environment, and as his reputation as a prophet and healer increased, some of his aristocratic contacts decided to introduce him to a new couple who had a great interest in miracle workers. Nicholas and Alexandra, the Emperor and Empress of Russia. They had been without a mystical advisor for some years now, ever since government ministers had forced them to send their last favorite, a French miracle worker, into exile. And Theophon, as well as the occult circles of St. Petersburg, thought they'd found the perfect replacement. So Rasputin, the Siberian peasant, entered the royal circle. Oh, dang! Now Grigori's gonna have to keep track of all those nobles, bureaucrats, ministers, and hangers-on. How's a holy man supposed to keep all that straight? Well, if World Anvil had been around back then, it would have been a breeze. You know, a lot of us here at Extra Credits have been creating our own imaginary worlds for years now, be they video games, RPGs, or novels. And as I'm sure you know, it can be a ton of work keeping all of the disparate elements organized, which is why we were so excited to check out World Anvil. It's an award-winning toolset used by millions of world builders, writers, and gamers that helps you create, store, and organize your world setting. And let me tell you, this toolset is robust as heck. 
You can use it to craft entire RPG campaigns, tracking timelines, family trees, and diplomatic relationships, create interactive maps to help bring your world to life, and once you're ready, you can easily share what you've built with your players, readers, patrons, or whoever. Not to mention, with over 25 stunning visual themes at your disposal, it's perfect for all genres, from sci-fi to fantasy, historical fiction to space opera. Which you know, come to think of it, means my Rift's Earth meets Enter the Gungeon 17th Century rom-com RPG campaign is now officially a possibility. And it's gonna get spicy. Right now, you can check out World Anvil yourself absolutely free. Or for a limited time, you can receive 40% off any annual membership using the code extra credits. Then, not only will the fantastical worlds you dream up be built better, but you'll be helping out our channel in the process. Once again, that's code extra credits for 40% off any annual membership, and thanks so much again. We can't wait to see what you build. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.